Hello everyone, welcome back to 3 News Now. I'm Stephanie Haney. This is where we bring you the top headlines from WKYC.com and our WKYC app. It is Wednesday, September 23rd. Thank you for being here to get filled in on everything that's impacting you here in Northeast Ohio. We start today with news that has gripped the nation. One officer, one former officer, has been charged related to the killing of Brianna Taylor, the 26-year-old EMT who was killed in her home on March 13th in Louisville, Kentucky, by members of the Louisville Metro Police. A grand jury has now indicted ex-officer Brett Hankison on three counts of first-degree wanton endangerment. There were no indictments today for the other officers who were involved in the incident that led to her killing that night. That is not the two other officers who were on the scene or a fourth officer who filed documents related to securing the no-knock warrant, which was used to enter Breonna Taylor's home that night and did not require police to identify themselves. Hankison was fired from the Louisville Metro Police Department in June. The police chief at that time said Hankinson wantonly and blindly fired 10 rounds into Breonna Taylor's apartment on the night she was killed. Now, people are reacting to this and are upset for a number of reasons, one of those being not only because the other officers present, Miles Cosgrove and Jonathan Manningly, have not been charged, which special prosecutor that was on the case today said that any additional charges are unlikely from the night at Breonna Taylor's home when she was killed on March 13th, but also because there were no charges brought alleged with the alleged issues with obtaining the no-knock warrant, which is something that was banned by the city on June 11th. No-knock warrants are no longer being used in the city of Louisville. That was not addressed today. The person who was responsible for the documents related to obtaining that no-knock warrant, Detective Joshua Janes, has been placed on administrative reassignment. The police chief said that matter has actually been referred to the FBI, which has launched its own investigation into Breonna Taylor's death. But another reason people are upset is that the felony charge of wanton endangerment is not based on the actual killing of Breonna Taylor. Her killing is not required for these charges. The Kentucky law states to be found guilty of wanton endangerment. A person is guilty of this when, under circumstances manifesting extreme indifference to the value of human life, that person engages in contact which creates a substantial danger of death or serious physical injury to another person, creates a substantial danger of death. Therefore, no death is actually required. So to be very clear, Hankison could have been indicted on these same charges if Breonna Taylor had lived. This charge, these three charges that he faces, are based on how Hankison fired his weapon. Kentucky Attorney General Daniel Cameron says it cannot be proven that any of the bullets fired by Hankison actually hit Taylor. Cameron said that FBI analysis actually determined that it was Cosgrove who appeared to have fired the fatal shot that hit Breonna Taylor, eventually leading to her taking the taking of her life. Cameron said that the investigation found that Mattingly and Cosgrove were justified in their use of force after having been fired upon by Kenneth Walker, who was in the apartment with Breonna Taylor the night that she died. Now, as a Class D felony... There is a minimum of one year in prison and a maximum of five years in prison in Kentucky. So Hankison has been charged with three counts of wanton endangerment in the first degree. So if he's found guilty on all of those three counts, those sentences at the at the sentencing judge's discretion could either run at the same time or back to back. So he's facing one to 15 years in prison related to these charges. Now, the attorney for the family, Ben Crump, called the charges outrageous and offensive. Brianna Taylor's mother had previously filed a wrongful death lawsuit in April against the officers involved, Hankison, Cosgrove, and Mattingly, and on September 15th, the city of Louisville announced a $12 million settlement with Brianna Taylor's family. Now, that's the largest sum paid by the city for a police misconduct case and did include reforms to be made within the police department, which was something that was critical to Breonna Taylor's family. Now, in preparation for this announcement today, the city of Louisville did declare a state of emergency 
Officers in Louisville have canceled vacations for this week, and a curfew has been set in Louisville for at least the next three days, starting at 9 p.m., extending till 6.30 in the morning. There are a few exceptions that are being allowed, including for people going to work and medical professionals. But people are clearly very upset by this update today that there is one officer charged related to the killing of Breonna Taylor, but not necessarily being called to count for the actual death of Breonna Taylor. As the attorney general did say, it could not be shown conclusively that the bullets fired by Hankinson actually hit Breonna Taylor. We'll have more on this on WKYC.com and our WKYC app as there are more developments related to those announcements and what happens in Louisville over the evening and the next several days. We now have the latest numbers in from the Ohio Department of Health here on COVID-19 in the state of Ohio. And what we are seeing today is a large increase in new daily reported cases and also a large increase in new daily reported deaths. In the past 24 hours, there have been 903 new cases of COVID-19 reported. That's up from 685 yesterday. Now, the Ohio Department of Health reports that just over 126,000 cases are presumed to be recovered right now. That's of the total almost 147,000 cases that we've known of here in the state of Ohio. So that's about 86% of those cases are presumed to be recovered at this point. Now, what that means, based on the Ohio Department of Health definition, is that's the number of people who exhibited symptoms of COVID-19 three weeks ago or longer ago and are still alive. Now, in the last seven days, our average positivity rating is 2.9%. So for all the COVID-19 tests being done in the last seven days, 2.9% of them are coming back positive, which is below the World Health Organization threshold of 5%. Now, in the last 24 hours, we have seen a large increase in reported deaths, which there is also a lag in the reporting of this data, but we've seen 52 new reported deaths in the last 24 hours. That's up from 12 new deaths reported yesterday and then several days when we were in the single digits for new reported deaths. So that brings the total number of deaths here in Ohio to now 4,687. We've seen 78 new hospitalizations in the last 24 hours. That's up a bit from yesterday. And now there are currently 593 people who are actively hospitalized related to COVID-19. Of those people who are hospitalized, 200 of them are in the intensive care unit right now. So that's about 34%, about one third of all people in the hospital in Ohio related to COVID-19 are being treated in an ICU. And there have been eight new ICU admissions reported in the last 24 hours. The total hospital bed occupancy in Ohio is now 75%. That's up 1% from yesterday. So 25% of the hospital beds in Ohio are available for people who do need inpatient treatment. Now let's take a look at the U.S. and global numbers related to COVID-19. These numbers come from Johns Hopkins University. Yesterday, we hit a grim milestone in the U.S. when the U.S. broke 200,000 reported deaths related to COVID-19. Globally, we are now within 30,000 deaths of hitting 1 million deaths. That's at the global level. Here's how those numbers break down according to Johns Hopkins University. Here in the U.S., there have been almost 7 million reported cases of COVID-19. That number is 6,911,844, and there have now been 201,253 reported deaths related to COVID-19. When we take a look about how that compares nationally to globally, in the U.S., we've got about 4% of the global population, but we do have about 21% of the COVID-19 deaths and about 22% of the known COVID-19 cases. Globally, the total number of cases is nearing 32 million. It's now at 31,713,913, and the total number of deaths globally is now at 972,000. 895, so within 30,000 of reaching that 1 million milestone, which is a milestone we don't want to see, but we are fast approaching at the global level. Now, back here in Ohio, Ohio House Republicans have introduced a bill to end Ohio's COVID-19 state of emergency. The bill is called Restore Ohio Now. And if it is enacted, it would immediately terminate Ohio's state of emergency resulting from the COVID-19 situation. And it would also rescind some of the health orders that have been acted, enacted by Governor Mike DeWine. 
Geauga County Representative Diane Grendel is a co-author on the bill, and she says that the bill has 15 co-sponsors. Here's what Representative Grendel had to say about the bill. Grendel said that many Ohioans have worked diligently in good faith with the governor to flatten the curve of COVID-19 for months, and we accomplished this goal a while back. Initially, there was much cause for concern regarding COVID-19. Governor Mike DeWine responded appropriately to an unknown threat facing Ohioans. Grendel went on to say the time has come to responsibly transition back to our lives before the pandemic, and this bill is a first step in that direction. Now, a quick fact check on Grendel saying that we flattened the curve for COVID-19 a few months back. We did appear to flatten the curve for a moment a few months back. However, the cases have not been flat as we have just seen today. They've been jumping around quite a bit with a large increase from yesterday to, the d- to today, and that depends on how you look at those numbers, of course. Grendel went on to say, it's crucial for the sake of our people in our constitution that one branch of government cannot solely supersede our entire state with overwhelming and unchecked authority. She then went on to say, government cannot protect us from every single one of life's risks. We have to rely on the judgment and responsibility of individual Ohioans in the exercise of their personal liberties. Now, this is not the first time the Republican-led state house has tried to put some restrictions on Governor Mike DeWine's power relating to the pandemic. However, virtually all of these bills that have been put forward have not gotten enough traction in order to pass or have not passed due to opposition in the Senate or the threat of a veto from also Republican Governor Mike DeWine. DeWine, however, did recently sign legislation that would prevent the unilateral closing of Ohio's places of worship or moving the date of election, which, if you remember, that did happen in March with Ohio's primary election that was delayed, and that was an Ohio public health order that made that happen. That was not an executive order from Governor Mike DeWine. Now, there have been orders that have been restricting business and mass gatherings, and they definitely have taken their toll on Ohio's economy. However, polls right now show that about 75% of Ohio residents approve of the way DeWine has been handling the pandemic. This approval rating is among the highest for any governor, not just now, but in state history. That does it today for your 3 News Now afternoon update for Wednesday, September 23rd. I'll see you next at 5 p.m. on What's New, and then I'll see you back here tomorrow on 3 News Now. Everyone stay safe, be well. I'm Stephanie Haney.